so much, Michael, for leading us. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, all of you. Good morning, City View. Good morning to all of those that are joining us online. We're glad that you've tuned in, that you're here uh, worshiping with us. What, a, what an incredible, such an encouraging time of worship. Michael and I didn't talk about this at all, but those songs that we just sang are so fitting for what I believe God wants to speak to us this morning. And so praise God for how he just orchestrates all of these things together. And God is good. He is truly worthy. And we're so, it's such a privilege to be able to worship together like that. Uh, for those of you who are joining here today or those of you joining us online, for the past three weeks we've been on a series on guilt and shame. And I just want to recap what we've been learning over the past few weeks. Just in case you need a refresher or if this is your first time visiting with us and you missed the other three messages, just to give a, a brief summary. We learned in the first week that guilt is a status. That it's not a feeling. And that we are either guilty or innocent. And that's our status. The bad news is that before a holy and righteous God, the holy and righteous one who we just sang about, that all of us stand guilty of not measuring up to a standard of holiness and a standard of righteousness. And so what we often try to do to measure up is we try to remove our guilt by changing the standard from God's holiness and making it about our happiness. We try to shift the blame onto something or someone else. And, but as we learned even a couple of weeks ago, changing the standard may make us feel better for a period of time. But ultimately, it will not and it cannot remove our guilt. The only solution is for us to come to the one who is able to fully remove our guilt and make us holy. To make us in right standing with the holy God. And that person is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And the good news is that those who have placed their faith and their hope in Jesus, the promise is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in him. In fact, it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, that we are holy and we are faultless, that we are blameless, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. We are holy and blameless before God. So that's guilt. Shame, on the other hand, is a feeling. It's a feeling of being unloved and unworthy. And because we feel ashamed, what we try to do is we try to cover it up by isolating ourselves from others because we don't want to reveal what's in our heart. We try to seek the approval of others. And we turn to false gods and we turn to idols to find our sense of security and our sense of identity but the problem with false gods is that although they may provide temporary relief, they cannot, they will not offer lasting freedom from shame. And the only solution is to find complete acceptance and deliverance and peace from the one who is truly worthy and who alone accepts us just as we are. All of our faults, all of our sins, not when we were holy and blameless while we were yet sinners, he accepted us. And while guilt is, is pretty straightforward for us to understand, I think shame is, isn't quite as clear cut. Because again, shame is an experience, the feeling. And it's oftentimes it's, so, it's hard to describe an experience or a feeling. I don't know if you ever had a conversation where he's like, you know what, I can't describe it, I just feel this way. So it's difficult to kind of put our finger on it and to kind of describe it in that way, but... The truth and the reality is we've all felt shame before. And for some of us here today, we are wrestling with feelings of being ashamed even as we speak. But the good news is that the Bible has a lot to say about shame. In fact, according to a word study conducted by Timothy Tennant, the term guilt and its various derivatives occurs 145 times in the Old Testament and 10 times in the New. And get this. Whereas the term shame and its derivatives occurs nearly 300 times in the Old Testament and 45 times in the New. More than double the amount. And so the Bible has a lot to say about shame. And not only that, but from a cultural perspective, there's a quote I found by Werner Mitschke. And he describes it this way. It's an important quote. And we have it up here on the screen. It says, the ancient Middle East was characterized by the pivotal cultural value of honor and shame. And the Bible came out of this ancient Middle Eastern culture. And thus, we can conclude that the Bible's pivotal cultural value is honor and shame. And again, 
the idea and, and the concept of guilt and innocence is pretty easy for us to understand and grasp. And shame and honor isn't quite as clear cut. And I think the reason why is because we live in, and most of us have grown up in a Western, with the Western worldview. In a Western worldview, in a culture of guilt and innocence. And generally, for those of us who have grown up here in the United States, the emphasis here is on equality and on the individual. And the value is placed on one's individual rights and the individual taking personal responsibility for their actions. And so this means that it's up to the individual person to alleviate that sense of guilt, either by confessing it or owning up to it, or by paying the penalty or the price for their offense and their crimes. However, shame in shame and honor cultures, and the emphasis is on the collective group, not on the individual. And the value is placed on community and conformity and being properly assimilated into society. There's an old Japanese proverb that says this. It says that the nail that sticks out is the one that gets hammered first. And again, it emphasizes the cultural value of conformity and assimilation. Don't stick out because if you do, you're going to be the first one that gets hammered down. And in the Eastern culture, one's perceived honor and shame among a group is absolutely essential. It is crucial for survival. Because the more honorable a person is, the greater status and reputation they have in society. It's sort of like a social credit score. And it has the potential to not only elevate them personally, it can benefit their entire family their, for generations to come. And conversely, shame leads to a lower social credit score. And this can damage and even destroy a person's reputation along with that of their family. And so this currency of honor and shame is extremely valuable and crucial in Eastern cultures of honor and shame. It's a powerful, powerful currency. Now, why do I bring all this up? It's important for us because this language of honor and shame is found all throughout Scripture. Because again, the Bible's pivotal cultural value is honor and shame. And it's important for us today to frame it through this lens because it will provide clarity and perspective into what we'll be looking at in God's Word this morning. So if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11 together. And then we're going to turn to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to look at two verses there. So John chapter 15, if we could all stand for the reading and the honor of reading of God's word. Starting from verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain. So that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you. And this is what I command you. Love one another. And then flip with me to Romans chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 9 and 10 together. The Apostle Paul writes, Let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in showing honor to one another. Outdo one another in showing honor honor. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you so much, God, for who you are, for your goodness and grace. God, as we now look into what you have to say for us, may we not just be receivers, may we be doers of your word, and may your word produce a fruit of righteousness in us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
please take your seats. Thank you. Now, in verses 9 through 11, Jesus summarizes the command that he gave to his disciples in the previous verses to remain, to abide in him. And the image that we find in verses 1 through 8 is that of a vine and its branches. And it says that once the vine is severed and disconnected to the vine, it loses its connection to the source of life and its ability to bear fruit. And this is why Jesus urges his disciples to stay connected, to remain, to abide in him and in his word that he has given to them. Why? Because by remaining in him and remaining in his love, they will produce much fruit, fruit that will last. And he concludes by encouraging, encouraging them here in verse 11. He says, I have told you all of these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And that word complete here is being filled to capacity, to the very, very top, to where nothing else can fit in, that our joy may be filled to capacity. And this echoes what it says in Psalm 16, verse 11, where the psalmist writes in the Old Testament, he says, You have made known to me the path of life in your presence. Again, as I abide and remain and stay connected to you, there is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. In other words, what this is saying is that True and lasting joy and freedom is found when we remain connected to the source of joy. And friends, that eternal source is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Nothing else. This is true not only when it comes to our joy, but true and lasting freedom from guilt and shame is found only through faith in the one who has the power and the authority to break the chains of guilt and deliver us from sin and shame. And I can say all that. And you may hear all that. And even though we may know all of this, it seems like it's, we seem to just crawl back to the same idols. We seem to go back to listening to, same, to the same lies that has kept us in this cycle of guilt and shame. And we start to believe these lies that say that you're not good enough. That you're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not talented enough. You're not successful enough. You're not spiritual enough. Come on now. And it feels like everything we do is just not enough. That sound familiar to any of you? Am I just the only one that feels this way? Come on. Am I the only one? And so we buy into these lies that tell us that we're not enough, that we don't measure up, that we don't have what it takes and the reason why I say that there are lies is because this is not what God says about you and me. God calls us his beloved sons and daughters. We are children of the most high God. And not only that, in Christ, we are no longer servants. He calls us friends. Jesus says to them in verse 15, he says, that I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I've made to you, known to you everything that I have heard from my father. And you have to understand that for these disciples that when they heard Jesus calling them friend, it was a big deal. Because they saw him as the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord, the Son of God, the, the chosen one of Israel. And he's here calling me friend. A big deal. You know, in the Old Testament, I was doing some research. There's a, there's a Hebrew word for friendship that refers to someone who you grant access into the secret places of your heart. The, the innermost places. In other words, it's a friend who is safe, who is trustworthy. Someone who you can pour your heart out to and you can, you can share everything with and confide in. Someone who you know will be there when it matters the most. It's that friend who will stick with you to the very end. Faithful and true. This is important because in the Greco-Roman world, people placed a high value on friendship. And they recognize the possibility that it might be necessary for a person to sacrifice his or her life on behalf 
of that friend. And so when Jesus says in verse 13 that no one, there is no one, there's no friend that is greater than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. It was completely understood by everyone. Everyone agreed that it was true, both Jews and Gentiles. And they agreed that, yes, a true friend is one who is willing to lay down his own life her own life for the sake of their friends. And Jesus, and the amazing thing is that Jesus was not only willing, he not only said it, he willingly gave his life on the cross for them. In other words, he showed them that he is the true friend. The one that willingly lays his life down for them. And he showed them the links that he was willing to go through to demonstrate his great love and commitment to them. To the point where he was even willing to go to hell and back for them. And friends, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, did this for you and me. And so if he loved us enough to give his life for, then who are we to say otherwise? And why is it that we keep on buying into that lie that says we're not enough? Church, how much more time and energy are we going to give to those lies that say that you're not enough? You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not talented enough that you can't measure up. Just think of all the talents and gifts and blessings that we've robbed from ourselves, that we've robbed from others because of the lies that we believe and the shame that we've carried around in our hearts for so, so long. Think of all the time and energy we've wasted because we've been looking around and we've been seeking the approval of others instead of looking to the one whose opinion, whose word, whose voice is the only one that matters. You know, throughout Scripture, we see this language, this image of covering, the beautiful word, covering. And we see it in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve attempt to cover themselves and with fig leaves because they realized that they were naked. And what does it say? They were ashamed. But it wasn't sufficient to cover their nakedness. And so it says that God made a garment out of skin, meaning something had to die and give its life. And, it, and he uses the skin to properly cover over their nakedness and shame. And this image is, of covering is echoed in Romans chapter 4, verse 7, where it says, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. And get this, whose sins are covered. And so what this means for us, for those of us who are in Christ and who are covered by his blood, is that we can now stand in full confidence and full assurance, knowing that our sins have been fully forgiven by the one who paid the price fully for our guilt and fully took upon our shame on himself. Amen. And friends, not only have we been forgiven, we have been given, we have received his honor. Notice again what it says in verse 15. It says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. In other words, I have elevated you from a place of shame to a position of honor. And because of this, we are no longer his servants, his enemies. We are friends. He calls us friend. And because we are his friends, our shame is covered. We are now clothed with his honor. And we are commanded to love and honor one another in the same way that he has loved and honored us. But then why is it that we often treat each other with such disrespect and dishonor? Now, I'm not talking about those outside the church, all right? I'm not talking about those outside of this place. I'm talking about us, church Christians. Because I don't know about you, but it seems like we're just more quick to levy shame on others rather than giving them honor. And we're so quick to judge and condemn and criticize and unfriend anyone who offends us, even if it's members in our own spiritual family. 
And oftentimes, it's all based on what the world has to say about them rather than what God says about them. And we make judgments on people. We criticize them based on what the world standard is instead of what God says is true about them. And unfortunately, this is the culture that we're living in today. One pastor put it this way. He said that if you're on a continuous search to be offended, then you will always find what you are looking for. In church, we are living in a culture that's almost looking to be offended and looking to be angry. And in many ways, we're looking for opportunities to dishonor one another. But church, that is the way that we are called to live is very different than the culture that we live in. Read what it says in Romans chapter 12. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Detest what is evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. It's also translated, outdo one another in showing honor. I love that. Outdo one another in showing honor. Friends, we are called to lead, take the lead in honoring one another and outdo one another in showing honor. I mean, just think what it would be like. And instead of trying to tear each other down, condemning one another because of a social media post, dismissing and dishonoring one another because of a political disagreement that we may have, that we do our best to outdo one another in showing honor. And let me bring it a little bit closer to home. Husbands, let me speak to y'all for a little bit. I heard you. <laughs> husbands, husbands, what if we were to take the lead in honoring our wives by outloving them? Mm. And wives, I don't want to leave y'all out. Wives, what if you committed to honoring your husband by out-respecting them? Mm. You say, because you say you want to marry, that's blessed. How about instead of tearing each other down, we work to out-give one another, out-cherish one another, out-serve one another, out-esteem one another, and out-bless one another. Imagine what would happen in our marriages. Amen. And not only in our marriages, but imagine the impact this would have in our families. Imagine the impact it would have in our workplaces, in our schools, in our campuses, and in our, with our friends and with our neighbors. Because one of the best ways, church, that we honor God is by honoring one another. And we do that by receiving our honor from God and by giving our honor to others. Now, don't get me wrong. God loves our worship, as Michael and Pastor Keith just explained to us. And he loves it when his people gather together to lift up his name. And he is honored by that. But at the same time, if we have either offended or dishonored a brother or sister, we are told in Matthew chapter 5 to leave our gift at the altar and first go and be reconciled with them. And then bring our offering. Then bring our gift. Then bring our worship. Because in as much as God values our personal relationship with him and our personal worship of him, he equally values our relationship, the relationship that we have with others. In many ways, the horizontal relationships that we have with the people around us is the life application of the vertical relationship that we have with Jesus. In order for us to give honor to others, we must first receive his honor. Because how can you expect to give something to someone that you don't even possess yourself? Hmm? And so in order to do that, we need to stop believing the lies and simply walk in his freedom. First and foremost, we need to stop believing the lies that say that we're not worthy of love and acceptance from others. We need to stop believing the lies that we need respect and approval of others in order to be valued. Stop believing the lies that we are defined by the failures and mistakes of our past, present. 
Stop believing the lies that we must perform and achieve in order to feel a sense of significance and importance. Stop believing the lies. And secondly, we need to walk in his freedom. And how we do that is we replace these lies with the truth of God's word. And daily abide in our identity in Jesus Christ and who he says he is. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you what God has to say. God calls us his masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He, we are new creations in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We are more than conquerors. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Citizens of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. And we are children of the living God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. This is who we are, church. This is who God says we are. This is our identity. And we can walk confidently and securely in the promise that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And not only do we need to receive... His great honor. We need to give honor to others. And what this means is that we should treat others the same way that God does, with dignity and respect. And we do that by cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. We bear fruit. And this means that we treat others with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In other words, we give honor to others by living out the fruit of the Spirit. This means that we are to give honor to those whom we love and cherish. These are our family and loved ones. The people we encounter on a regular basis. These are our coworkers, our neighbors, and our friends. We give honor to those who are in positions of authority our local and national leaders. Not because we agree with them, but because God has placed them there. And we honor them by praying for them and praying God's wisdom over them. Not only that, but we are to honor our spiritual leaders, the people that God has brought into our lives, past and present. We honor them and the investment that they have made spiritually into our lives. And not only that, we are to honor those who serve us faithfully week in and week out. To all those folks that are taking care of our kids, we are to honor them. To all those people in the back on the stream team that no one else sees, we honor them. To those people on stage and in the back, to those greeting outside, all of those who serve us so faithfully, we honor them. Friends, if you want to walk in freedom from guilt and shame, we need to stop believing the lies and start receiving our honor and identity from the one who is most worthy of all honor. And not only do we need to receive his honor, we need to give our honor to others. And the incredible promise is that when we do, our joy will be complete. It will be made full. You know, I was inspired this week by an illustration that I, I, I want to use um, because I think it's such a powerful illustration. As some of you may know, I used to live in Chicago, and um, I've asked my beautiful wife to help me out here. I used, to leave, I used to live in Chicago, and right here I have in my hands a genuine, authentically signed basketball by Michael Jordan. It's precious, right? And I'm not lying. It is signed by Michael Jordan. And before you start thinking, is the great basketball legend Michael Jordan, I'm talking about another legend. Oh, y'all didn't see that coming, did y'all? Y'all didn't see that coming. Now, I asked Michael to do this, and he's like, what am I doing this for? And I said, like, you'll find out. But, Michael, is this the only basketball that you've ever signed? All right, so it's a one-of-a-kind basketball sign by the Michael 
in Jordan. Now, why do I bring this illustration up? Why do I bring this example up? I'm going to put this away before y'all start going crazy. So why do I bring this example up? You know, what makes that basketball valuable and unique and special is the name that is on it. Amen. And likewise, you and I, for those of us who are in Christ, we too have a name on us. You know what makes you valuable? Do you know what makes you precious? Friends, it is a name of Jesus. It is a name that is above every name. And because his name is on you, you are valuable. You are of worth. You are honorable in the eyes of our heavenly father. And it is the name of Jesus alone that brings eternal value and worth to who we are. And he calls us to stop believing the other lies. And to honor him by taking the lead and outdoing one another and showing honor. Can we do that, church? Can we commit to doing that together today? This week? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Jesus, we thank you that you call us friend. We are no longer enemies. We are no longer servants. But we are friends of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray that this word would speak to us, God. I especially pray for those who are hurting, who are battling guilt and shame those who may feel far from you, those who feel like you are far away, I pray that, God, that your word would be drawing them near to you now, even as we speak, God. I pray for those who do not know you, God, this morning, who have yet to place their faith in you, that, God, that you would stir their heart and their affection to turn to the one who gives them infinite value and worth that your name would be on their heart today and for the rest of us. I pray that this word would be a, a, a humbling and encouraging reminder that we're not the lies that the world says we are. We are who you say we are. So God, may this truth be your word speak to us, minister to us long after we leave this place. It's in Jesus' name.